excited. Take you one moment. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Stacy's recording. You're good. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Jenny Antelak is an ICF credentialed master certified coach, and she is the co founder and president of Learning Journeys, a coaching certification institute. She co develops and teaches several programs the ACTP Practitioner, Mastery, and Narrative Coaching Certification. She also develops innovative, relevant, and reliable tools that support our coaching development and expertise. In revealing what today's content was going to be about, I read the most powerful statement that in my opinion could be the most devastating for all of us who love coaching. Quote, it only takes one rogue coach to deviate from the standards to negatively impact the entire field of coaching, unquote. Thank you, Jenny. I'm really happy to have you here because you're so committed to keeping our field of coaching credible and out of the licensing uh, sphere. <laughs> so yes. welcome, Jenny. Uh, thank you. Yes, I have been to uh, the legislature when, what was it, like two years ago, three years ago, there was all the hoopla about that they were going to regulate and and so I ended up down there. My mother ended up sitting with Congress and all these and two other coaches that are close friends of mine. Um, and, and really it was about, uh, we kept graying the lines. And I, if, we, if we continue to gray the lines, then, um, somebody is going to step in and say, whoa, this isn't legit. And, and so how do we uphold the standards so that that doesn't happen and that we have the freedom to move forward and build and support, I think not just build, but support um, a modality that I think is unique and is needed throughout the world now more than ever. And it really is about us all coming together and saying, I am committing to protecting this. Uh, but that takes work. And it takes, I think for a lot of us, it takes a lot of unlearning too. Because <laughs> what we have um, been taught our entire lives is that to be good and effective citizens is to help people. And and to help people is to give them advice. And now we're saying, well, there's another way too. And, and so how do you trust that they have the capacity to lead themselves through their lives? And our job is to sit on the sidelines and just simply um, ask great questions so that they can find the resourcefulness inside of them. And so I love, love, love that you guys are doing that book club and the the name of the book is Humble Inquiry. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, it is. Awesome. Well, so today I, it would, and I know it's a challenge with Zoom, but it would be really great if this was more of a conversation than a talking head because um, I, I could talk all day, yet I don't think that that is going to be as effective as um, you all sharing your two cents and adding your wisdom to the conversation. And so uh, rather than waiting till the end to ask questions or contribute, please don't hesitate to contribute all along the way. Um, I am gonna share my screen and you, somebody said it's hard to hear me. Is that true? Can you guys hear me now? That's better. That's good. Okay, sorry. Um, I shut down my offices because we couldn't have class in person anymore. And so now I am in a makeshift office and I forget that I'm not as close to my screen. So thank you for <laughs> letting me know that I need to move closer. Uh, when I think about ethics and when I teach ethics, I really talk about that the gift of ethics, even though um, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to have that conversation. That would be boring. 
is it is one of the most important conversations you can have because it's not just going to protect your client, it's going to protect you, and it's also going to protect the field of coaching. And we are playing in three different realms all the time as we are trying to figure out how do I uphold my own personal ethics? How do I uphold the coaching ethics? And then um, where do my own worth ethics come into play here so that um, I don't find consistent conflict in this, that I can find some ease in it. And the best way to do that is to think ahead of time rather than waiting until you are in some sort of predicament and you're like, oh, now what do I do? Uh, and, and so to begin this process, what I invite everybody to do is to answer these questions for yourself. Uh, what are your core values? And how do you maintain these values while working with your clients? <clears throat> and, and, and this leads to these coaching ethics is looking at um, what coaching ethics sometimes collide with personal values. I was giving a talk one day and a gal approached me afterwards and said, I did not realize what I was doing to my clients because she has a personal value about the, she believes that marriage is sacred and that you do not break up a marriage, that you figure out how to resolve your issues. And so when her clients were coming to her for relationship issues, uh, she would forego the coaching ethics and step in and lead with her personal ethics. And, and she said, I didn't realize that I was violating part of the principles of coaching because my personal values were so important to me. And so where are you finding that um, there is this collision maybe that's happening and what do you do about it? How are you guys managing that? I, I don't have some um, racism. Having, um, I had uh, somebody come to me saying, what do I do about uh, coaching somebody that is really racist? And I'm uncomfortable as a coach, as she said, about it. And I, I, I found that to be, you know, maybe during this time, that is an area that is going to continue. I don't know, Jenny, what, what, I don't know what you might say to that. Because marriage, I understand that. But if you're non-judgmental, Mm -hmm. And you have a client that is continuing saying maybe racist remarks. Well, I, I think that um, it, then it is about uh, what is in your agreements and do you have a backup plan? Because it doesn't, it, it could be that or it could be something completely different. I had a, a coach that, um, she started coaching somebody that had a very similar story to hers and she was responding the exact opposite than what um, she wanted her to. And she, her response to it was, I can't be a good coach to you. And I think it's unethical for me to stay in this relationship because you signed up for this expectation and I can't serve the expectation. And so she found her a new coach. And, and I think the same is true for issues like that is that if you can't uphold what the agreements say I'm willing to uphold, then can you find them somewhere, someone else? And simply, you don't have to make them right or wrong, just, put out there that I would just wouldn't be a good coach for you. Right, right, good, good. Thank you, I appreciate that. Lisa. So am I hearing a suggestion perhaps that if we have some real 
ethical or personal value boundaries that those should be um, included in our um, agreement? Um, or how, how would you do that? How would you handle that? If, if there, if you know, Lisa, that you're going to um, encounter certain things that you feel like if I encountered this, I would have to break the agreement. It's great if you can put it up front so that they know that and they're willing to step into that relationship knowing that if I expose this, that you will one, find me another coach or that the, the agreement needs to be terminated or the relationship needs to be terminated. Um, an example of that would be, uh, we are not mandated reporters. However, I have a lot of coaches that um, really are in situations where they are encountering um, people that could possibly endanger their children, could possibly um, be endangering themselves. And so they put it in their agreement that part of my values is to report this. Are you okay with that? And if they sign that, then okay. So I will, I will follow through if you share something with me that falls under that category. Okay, and huh? yeah, and along that same line, it occurs to me that the the way we put out our coaching business could sort of self-select certain customers, or or not, or deselect those who who might fall in that category. Oh, absolutely. I think it, then you're just playing it more safe that they know um, that these are your boundaries. Yeah. But I also think it upholds the, the ethics of coaching because you say, I know I need to uphold these standards. And I know as a human that um, I, this will get me triggered and I don't want to violate that and I want to do right by you. And so I think it just ups the bar for you ethically because you're putting it out there right in front of them. Uh, what else came up for any of you when you think about your uh, personal ethics, coaching ethics, and maybe even work ethics? Okay, I just saw somebody raise their hand and then they, oh, Linda, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm still thinking about Lisa's conundrum. And I'm wondering, I mean, I know Lisa has some very strong values around the environment and protection. And that's probably obvious. I mean, if anybody's looking for a coach and looking and matching up, they would find her. But insofar as putting those kinds of things in your uh, agreement, in your contract, I'm wondering if it might be usually most appropriate to just, it would be part of discovery session. Well, it, it totally could be, Linda. And I don't know that, I mean, I guess I would have to have a longer conversation with, with Lisa about what exactly it is. Um, I'm looking at the extreme situation of mandated reporter, but um, in some cases it might just be that you'll realize that this isn't a good fit because it's just too hard to coach somebody because their view is so different. Yeah. But you could have in um, your agreements that if, if there is a conflict, and this is where um, if you look further back in the handouts um, about contracts is that either one of us are free to cancel the contract at any time. And, and so then you're not stuck to, um, you promised me that you were gonna coach me for 12 sessions and now you're canceling that, you owe me all this money back or whatever the case may be that then it could protect 
uh, somebody by saying under that either one of us are free to cancel the contract at any time. So that might be another way to get around it. <clears throat> uh, one that I struggle with a lot um, is the work ethic and, and maybe hopefully you guys don't even encounter this ever, but I will see uh, somebody that is coaching and then all of a sudden they feel like the individual uh, isn't seeing something. So they'll immediately just be like, well, I'm going to take off my coaching hat and, and for a moment not be a coach. And I'm like, what? <laughs> then you don't really buy into coaching. <laughs> And, and so I've decided, I'm probably taking an over-exaggerated stand on this by uh, teaching ethics all the time. And uh, I started a school and we certify individuals and I hold true to those standards. Uh, but what are some things that you guys are noticing that you're like, oh, I really wish people would honor this or uphold certain pieces of the coaching that you're not seeing right now? Anyone? You guys are so quiet. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> well, I agree with you uh, on the coaching hat one. To me, it just feels like an excuse to give advice or to mentor or to consult uh, versus staying within the coaching range. Uh, Work ethics. I I don't, I don't know that I have too many conflicts. Other, than, uh, I work around so many great coaches. I mean, we're such collaborating colleagues. So I'm just I don't know. You'll have to prompt us more. I think. <laughs> well, that is fine. Um, and we can always come back. Right. So so ethics lie well beyond. Uh, the coaching itself, but I wanted to start here with the premise of coaching because it is the beginning of everything else unraveling or coming together nicely. And some of the pitfalls to pay attention to, and I think this fits into that work ethics, it also can fit into those personal values and coaching is this temptation that if you get hired by a company, and you are seeing that um, the person that you're coaching isn't hitting the outcomes that the company wants, then you'll start to take ownership and start to drive them towards certain outcomes because you feel that your responsibility is to the organization rather than that person. And I think that there, there can be an ethical dilemma there and it can, it can really impact the outcomes down the road, it can impact your trust with that individual. Also, it impacts their development. And um, the field of coaching, because you're taking on responsibility for this versus trusting the process and trusting that if I just did a better job at coaching, maybe they would get to the outcomes or maybe they're meant to find other outcomes. I've had a uh, two executives in the last couple of years that the company hired me to improve their leadership qualities. And about, I would say halfway through the process, the leaders realized, I don't want to be here. And that was not the outcome the company wanted. But by the, the client um, owning that decision, there was this great relationship that was created between the two that I don't think would have happened if I would have driven it to the outcome the company wanted. And instead, the executive got to create a new story for himself and the company was in good standings with 
that employee. Um, but so many times we get worried and then we jump in. Another one is this responsibility is that a lot of us have this value about truth and that when we are coaching people, if we don't, um, and they are telling us something that we don't think is true or that they're not seeing another truth, then we jump in and feel responsible that if I do not tell you this, then it is irresponsible of me. And yet, what if they don't have a relationship with that information? What if that is more about me wanting you to have this information than about you actually valuing the information? And as an example, I have um, a friend that is a coach, but she is also a doctor. And she saw this repeated pattern happening at work with this teenager that had severe diabetes and every doctor kept going in and when it was their turn to treat the kid um, they leaned on responsibility i need to educate him and she went in after months of getting no results and his diabetes getting worse and worse and worse and showed up as a coach and asked him what do you want to focus on each time you come here. And he said, what I really want to focus on is I have to figure out how to eat differently. And this time, all I want to focus on is I want to see what I can create for myself to understand when I go to school, what is going to work for food for me. And when she went in with that, he started to change his diet. And then he started to take responsibility and move into these other areas, but everybody else was leading with, that's irresponsible. <laughs> uh, and, and there again, we can, we can get in this dilemma of, if my job says do no harm, but I can't see results, can't, you know, the coaching really says trust the process. And, and what do I lean into? Another pitfall that we can find ourselves in is the map versus territory. And what I mean by that is that uh, if we have the same clients or same issues that can consistently show up, we tend to think that, oh, A equals B. So if, if there's this issue, then I'll just coach this person this way and I can continue to do that. But the reality is, is we are all unique. Even when the problem is the same, our response to the problem is unique. And so we can't all have the same map. And, and so where am I maybe falling into the pitfall of responding similarly to the people that I'm coaching? And can I step back and evaluate that? And then the last one is this imposter versus authentic. And there is a great, if you guys have never read the article, I really encourage you to, and I can email it to you as well. I can uh, give it to you, Stacy, and you can share it is um, an article by Parker Palmer. And he talks about in there that we feel like um, I should give you information. And if if you take it on, great. But if you don't, at least I gave you the information and so I can cut and run. Uh, but the reality is, is that when we give somebody else information, they feel that they are responsible to do something with that. And they feel like an imposter because it's not theirs. And our job as coaches is to help them find themselves and to be true to that. And yet um, we feel like we are uh, helpless if we do not help. And, and so then we can find ourselves in this ethical dilemma of I'm uh, maybe dishonoring a value of mine because I'm honoring coaching. And yet, could you actually, uh, by honoring coaching, honor your values in a different way? You just have to um, see it differently. Any thoughts or comments before I go on or debates?
Yes, I, I would just love to have an example of map versus territory and imposter versus authentic. I, I think I'm following you not, not as clearly as I might. Oh, okay. So map versus territory. So um, I had somebody in um, our certification program that he also was a psychologist. And in the class, one of the things that we do is we have everybody create a floor plan of the house that they grew up in. And this, so he was coaching this individual and the individual that created the, the floor plan drew all the rooms, but drew no doors. And so the psychologist immediately said, well, where I, my natural tendency, my training tells me that if there's no doors, there's something you are hiding from. And, and so that is his map of, um, because of my therapy background, that's what doors, the meaning of doors is. And so he was wanting to place that on the situation, but the guy's like, uh, no, that's not what it means at all. I just didn't even think about putting doors, but if you want me to put doors, <laughs> um, and, but I think we do that all the time is, oh, if somebody is hesitating on, on action, I've seen the same exact hesitation, the same, I have heard the same words, it must mean that it's an issue of courage um, because that's what it's been every single other client I've had. But maybe with this client, it has nothing to do with courage. It has to do with time. But I didn't ask follow-up questions. And so I used this process to resolve the problem when that wasn't really the problem at all. Does that make sense, Linda? Yeah, it does. It, it sounds like you're talking about failing to honor the context that the, the mm -hmm. client presents. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It also sounds about being curious rather than judgmental. Mm hmm. And yeah. isn't that like the cornerstone of coaching? And yet we all have these filters that we accidentally fall into, especially when we're we're struggling to figure out how do I help this person? And then we have our habitual ways of responding. So, and Linda, was your other question around responsibility versus relationship? No, uh, imposter versus authentic. I'm not sh sure what, where you're going with that. If you could think uh, of an example, it'd be great. Yeah, that, um, I think um, when, when somebody starts to drive us down a, a resolution that they that has helped them, and they think that that same resolution will help us, and it's a shortcut. Uh, but then I, I don't understand it, and I try to uphold it, but it's not mine. Um, is that the client who, who, who is trying to uphold it? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if I've got this, but it sounds almost like um, if you have a client who's in pre-contemplation, you, if you, if you give them information, data, then they're just going to be anxious and they're going to be defensive and they're, I mean, they're not going to listen, right? Is that, sort of where you're going with that? It could be, or um, it, it could be, it could be that they shut down. It could be that um, they just feel like, um, I don't know, I don't understand this information or value this information. And in that article that I reference, uh, he talks about, he's, Parker Palmer is um, a psychologist. He's helped a ton of people. And, but he talks about that at one point in his life, he was severely depressed. Mm -hmm. 
and and so people would come with this attitude of, of come on you have helped so many other people you are great and and you just need to take that on and realize how great you are and so you will feel better about yourself if you lean into that and he said the more that people did that the more he felt like a fraud and and that's the only time that he was able to get out of that is when somebody actually sat with them and allowed him to figure out how to find himself yeah, and that they they didn't put it on him that you just need to see how amazing you are i think if i remember right they just sat and came and rubbed his feet every day it, yes they did you are yeah. correct you have a great memory yes okay so it's not you know not um, imposing your solutions basically mm -hmm. um, yeah could have a you know lots of different outcomes i guess for the client but one could be that they feel like they're not who they thought they were or who who they people expect them to be right right i think um uh, somebody gave me the example yesterday that i uh, they're, they're a really well-known speaker and they bombed it one day and they had the guts to say it out loud. I know I suck at this today. And immediately people were like, oh no, but don't you remember how amazing you were here? Don't you, you are, this, this is nothing. And it's like, can't I just sit in this for a minute to figure out what I wanna do with it? Because now I feel like um, you're not even seeing what happened. And, and how do I source through that uncomfortability if nobody allows me to be in it? And I, I think it goes to where am I coaching from? Am I coaching from my personal values? Am I coaching from my, co my coaching ethics? Where, is, where am I sitting? Vicki, what were you going to add? I was, I'm going to say it sounds also to me like a, a cheerleading instead of supporting <laughs> the client. You know, yeah, often like Yeah. And I think it goes to our uncomfortability. Yeah. And, and then do we make it into an ethical issue because I'm not upholding coaching? So, um, I invite everybody to go through and think about when you put in place your own standards for really your personal guidelines of how you want to show up as a coach and and if you have a coaching business um how would you answer each one of these would it be true or would it be false For this first one, what are your thoughts on it? I should list an average length of time for coaching. Well, mine is false because I have a length of time. Average could be, is, is, to me, it's blurry, it's gray. And in our agreement, we know how much time it's going to be. But I definitely lift it. Yeah, this one, um, Lisa, what were you gonna add? Oh, I was gonna say, um, I wouldn't list an average time because that sets expectations. And, you know, I've just found that different people need different amounts of times they process at different speeds. I might give a range, just generally it's from here to here, but basically, you know, it's it's w whatever it takes within that session to achieve your your goals, unless you or I have a set hard time limit. I mean, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't list an average. 
Yeah, this is a hard one because I think so many people do ask, how long is it going to take? And the reality is, is, I don't know how long does it take you to achieve things? <laughs> and which is not the answer they want. And yet, how do you protect yourself in that process so that you aren't promising something or setting an expectation unintentionally uh, that now they are kind of adhering to? The second one, I don't need a contract for pro bono client, clients. Stacey. I think that would be false. Yeah, I think even having some simple agreement uh, with everybody you coach is going to protect you. It's also gonna protect them uh, and they will take it more seriously. That's always my fear is that uh, the individuals that uh, don't have skin in the game, how do you get agreement with them so that they, they value it equally as much as those who are paying for this? And they know the boundaries of it. Um, once a contract is signed, I have to honor their original quote, even if there is an error in the calculations. How would you guys handle that? Chris? Well, I presume you're just talking about the dollars in this particular case. Yeah. And and, would... Yeah, but what else were you thinking? Well, I just thinking if you, when you put your coaching agreement forward, uh, and I can't think of a specific example, but are the things in there that you expect to do maybe maybe it's talking about the tools that you will use you know whether using a hogan or something like that and then you it transpires that they've done a hogan and they didn't like it and you want to do something differently those things i think would be changeable but if you've made you know if you've made an error in the quote my personally i would i would stick to it unless i'd significantly overcharge them yeah yeah so chris I actually did this last year. I, um, I wrote up a contract or a proposal for this group. And then uh, the first proposal, they wanted it edited and they wanted a bunch of things changed. And at the same time I was doing, and do not do this, <laughs> I was writing up another contract for somebody else. And I think I was distracted. And so this first contract, I misquoted it by $35,000. And I realized it at three in the morning. And we had already started the process. And, and so um, I reached out to them and said, this is completely my mistake. And this is the contract that we had signed and I will honor it. I, I'm asking if there is a way to have a conversation about it and if there is any leeway or not. And if not, I completely understand because it is my mistake. Um, and, and they allowed for um, some adjustments, not a ton, but some, uh, but the reason why they did it is because I was upfront about how much I screwed up and I was willing to, to stay, stay in that place. Um, and I think that those are the things to just think through. If I screw up something or I left something out of an agreement, um, how am I going to handle going back? And what does that look like? And, and will I be okay with how I handle it? What was the end result, just out of curiosity? Um, they decreased some of their hours and uh, increased the pay by 10,000. So um, it wasn't a, a complete even Steven, but I felt good about it and, and they felt okay about it too. So, and I stayed in good standings with them, which was more important to me, even though I had to pay other people 
it was coming out and I, I paid the price for screwing that up, but it was a great lesson too. Uh, the next one, when requested, I can give accounting the names and departments of each of their employees receiving coaching. Christina, how would you handle that? This is something I, um, I don't really come across because normally I'm, I'm a, I work as a corporate coach. So I work in multinational companies um, with several people, lots of different people, different departments, different countries. So they, most of the time they have a defined process how to handle these kind of things. And we would normally do not or do as it is the customs in, in this company um use the real names some some have the rule to use numbers or a, a contract number and uh, and to not give the names but others they just handle with the real names well and i think that's good to know um it has to have each of you think through um in this situation do, does it need to be coded differently? Uh, like Christina, I just got hired by an accounting firm and the HR said, okay, so, so everybody else in the company doesn't know that this person is being coached. I need you to send the invoice to me and I need it to say something different than coaching. Because in our company, coaching, it, means bad and and he's not we're not doing this because he is deficient at something and and so how are you guys going to think through how do i um, protect a person's reputation and how do i protect the confidentiality because who's getting this information so it sounds like christina you you, you do a lot of the confidentiality piece already. And um, this last one, I feel the person I am coaching needs the training I offer. I hear this one all the time is, you know, in the middle of my coaching, I'm also as uh, I teach speech writing and giving public speaking uh, training. And clearly that's what they need. So should I? What are your guys' thoughts? Christina? Okay. Yeah, this is something uh, that happens um, at times, but also um, I have that in my own um, contracts or the, the people um, who offer the contract have it there that that it is clearly separated and that we might talk about that or I might talk with the client and say, hey, um, I know you have a large catalog of, of training offerings in your company. Why don't you have a look at <laughs> and or and this is so this I would rather be a consultant in that in that moment, um, an informal consultant that I would say, hey, why don't you have a look? I don't think this is this is something we will do here in our coaching contract. Um, why don't you have a look and, and see whether you can get a training? But it's not about myself being the, in the training. Um, it's more about about the, what the client needs. Yeah, I think this is a, a sticky one. Um, that if you get into situations what can happen is that when we offer something that then that i i can do this or i have these these pieces um that they can feel obligated even if that's not your intention and and so really if it comes up that they decide gosh i need this training to simply ask, where do you want to get that information from? And what kind of training? Can you ask additional questions? And if they know that's what you do, then ask them 
um, can we have a separate conversation afterwards if they say, hey, Christina, I know you have this. <laughs> um, and I'd really like to just get it from you. Then saying, okay, well, let's finish the coaching and I will come back to this and ask follow-up questions to make sure at the end, after your coaching is done, if that's really what you want. Um, and so that it just protects you and it protects them from not feeling obligated, like, oh gosh, I, sh and not that you would do this, Christina, or make them feel that way, but I'm just saying in general, um, just to protect uh, the relationship, the coaching relationship. Uh, even I have, I have a number of coaches that they work in pregnancy centers. So they provide housing, they provide free services to women that are unmarried and in poverty. And they have all these resources available at their fingertips. And yet when they are coaching, they make it very clear. Like if somebody says, I need housing, that they ask questions of, um, where do you want to figure, or how do you want to figure out how to get housing? And um, where are you going to um, look for that information? And, and so they, they keep the boundary of coaching and have them solve that for themselves rather than say, well, I have, you can just get that at the front desk and we'll set you up. Um, and, and so it just helps them become resourceful in that process and get really clear about uh, what am I asking of you? And then I fully see you as a coach. It's not that you cannot have another contract with them. You can, but then it makes it, then the other contract isn't a part of the coaching and it doesn't gray those lines of what am I doing right now? Does that make sense? Yes, no. Arguments, debates. You guys are so quiet, I don't know how to take that. <laughs> Mike, what are your thoughts? Unmute. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great point. I really took that one. I thought of many examples where I didn't keep that boundary. And I thought that is the question I need to ask them. Where do you want to get that information from? That's fantastic. So I'm going to use that. Yeah, I even had, I was coaching. This gal hired me to coach her. And what she wanted coaching on was she wanted to be a coach and she wanted to find the right certification program. And I own my own school and she knows that. And it was so hard to sit on the sky, the sidelines and not just say, well, you should take our program. Um, but what it allowed for is that she felt it was a safe enough environment for her to explore what really was she looking for? And was it really coaching or was it more than that? And she got a lot of clarity and I had her as a client for a year. Um, and she went to a completely different school, but she was, if I would have just jumped in, I think that I would have destroyed that trust and she would have gone down a path that maybe didn't fit exactly what she was looking for. And on this next slide, it has common causes of ethical complaints. And I just want to check in, Stacy. Um, how are we doing on time? We're doing great. We have a whole another half hour that we could use. I did want to bring up one question, though, that a person asked, and that was the title of the Parker Palmer article. Um, I believe, and Linda, you might have to help me with this. Is it the perils of advice? Does that sound correct? I, I put it in, in chat where I found it was in his latest book, Let Your Life Speak, but that's more of an anthology with his own commentaries on some past pieces. So 
yeah, I, I don't know where it originally appeared, but it's definitely in Let Your Life Speak, his last yeah. book. I, I believe that you can just um, put in the search, uh, Parker Palmer advice, and you'll find the article. Or, or, or even Parker Palmer depression or something like that. Because mm -hmm. it was yeah. about, about his dark period. Yeah. Um, this list could be so much longer than what I have out here. And if you ever want to go to uh, the ICF website, they have numerous uh, resources of, okay, this is what I'm dealing with. How do I um, respond in a proper way? Uh, as you go through these, just think about what am I doing today and what else could I be doing? And the first one is this piece of unclear agreements and explanations. And I, I think Chris, you mentioned this is uh, really looking at um, what am I putting in my agreements and even if I have, you, you mentioned Hogan, is if, if I am going to use a certain tool, do I have something in there that we're not tied to that tool? So that they know that they have the freedom to use something different. Or in, and what are the agreements between if a company hires you and you are coaching somebody specifically, uh, what is the communication? And how is that handled? And who is protected inside of that communication? Mm -hmm. How clear is that? I have people a lot of times assume that because the company hires me that I'm going to give HR, whoever is the hiring person information and I will never do that. And so I have it right in my agreements that I am not responsible or nor will I report to you what's going on. That is an agreement you have to make with your employee and you. Chris, what have you found that you have learned <laughs> along the way that you have to have in your agreements? Uh, well, I, I'm doing, a, I have an, a, a coaching agreement. I'm working for a larger company just on, on a, a contract with them. And I, in, I inherited a client and the instructions I was given, the, the full agreement was signed up previously by somebody else. And they, the instruction was just, this is one of our bright rising stars, coach him to be better. Mm. And that was it. So we worked away uh, for about six months. And at the end, we had a, re well, actually it was about five months into this. Um, I got a call from the CHRO saying, um, we're not seeing the success that we thought we'd see with this guy. And the conversations I'd had with my client was, he was really happy. We'd picked two or three things to coach on. He felt he'd address those. He felt he was doing a lot better, but clearly this wasn't evident to the CHRO. And she wanted to know what we'd done and why we hadn't coached around a couple of other things. And I said, well, I, I, that's between me and the client. We can't discuss that, but if you don't, have clarity in the agreement up front about what success looks like and what your expected and desired outcomes are, how can you expect him, let alone me, to know what it is that you want out of this agreement? So we actually uh, put a hold on that conversation, on that coaching session. We revisited the coaching agreement. We went back through what a desired outcome would look like and what success would look like. And now we, we're back on track with that, but we have some very specific goals and expectations for both the client and the company that he works for. But the, the lack of clarity in that initial agreement about what everybody was looking for was uh, problematic, to say the least. So I, I will never enter another agreement like that without having uh, those clear understandings set out up front, even if I don't do the initial negotiation. Right. And I, I think that when you don't do the initial, you really need to do it because you don't know what was implied or mm -hmm. what, what they assumed inside of that. So, yeah. Um, um, one that may, may never happen to you, but if you have um, 
your own coaching tools or resources that you use. Uh, and you are going to like, I, I've been contracted by several universities to coach their students or their advisors. And when they sign an agreement, one thing that they automatically put in the agreement is that they own everything that is utilized. And you want to make sure that you read that agreement through and through and have them take that out because you are the owner of that. Um, <clears throat> but they will try to get, that's just an automatic piece of working with universities. Um, also, wait to consider is if you are going to change your pricing at some point and this agreement is a longer agreement putting in there that there is this pricing for this long and then then it gives you the freedom to up your pricing so that you're not stuck inside of the former pricing but you have to spell that out otherwise uh, you can get caught in a weird uh, situation. And if you have pricing for different people, like I have pricing for nonprofit, and then there's pricing for corporate. And if you don't spell it out, this is a small world. People talk. <laughs> Make sure that you have um, it very clear why you have certain pricing for certain things. Uh, misrepresentation of credentials or experience. I, I see a lot of people saying, well, I'm an executive coach, uh, but, but the reality is, is they have never coached an executive or they've only done it once. <laughs> and you, you can definitely say that this is where I am specializing. It, it really is misrepresenting you in the field if if you blanket state that that's that's what you're doing right now because you haven't done it yet yeah lisa in the accredited coach training program that linda and i did they actually had a sub certification as an executive coach as mm -hmm. part of the initial credentialing um what are your thoughts on that and you know official credentials along those specializations well, I think that um, I would put that that's what your specialty is in. And um, and then just decide, Lisa, at what point does it make you um, a skilled coach in that area? Like, is it five, coaching five executive coaches that now I'm skilled at this? Or is it 10? Or what? what is your threshold to feel like I can not only say that I'm trained in this, but that I am very skilled in this. I have a lot of experience in this. Well, I'll, I'll give a specific example. So when I initially credentialed, um, I did it as, as a health coach, but mm -hmm. I've decided not to pursue that. I decided to pursue career coaching for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. So I won't, I won't, uh, I don't put it out there that I'm a health coach anymore because I haven't done the latest certification and because that was like, you know, 10 years ago, you know, the IBWHC or whatever it's called, Linda knows, <laughs> um, you know, but I guess where's, I mean, I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't call myself a health coach if I hadn't kept the credentialing up in that specialty. So we just like your thoughts on some of that. Yeah, I, I think that if you, if you aren't continuously upgrading or refreshing your skills in it, um, that does it misrepresent your, your level of expertise. And, and so even thinking about what are, and some of this is, you know, it goes back to even those true false questions of, yeah, technically I could get away with all of that, but will I feel okay about it? And, and where is your moral, uh, guidelines of this is how I want to show up and this is the story that I want to put out there is that my standards are here and what's included in those standards is that I do um, 
continuing education six times a year that what are what are the rules that make me this and that allow me to confidently go and 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 share with the world that I am the person you can trust. And I think that's going to be different for different people, but really thinking about what are going to be my rules, especially since this is not regulated. Um, I invite each of you to really find your group of people that are going to have pretty much the same standards that we all are going to uphold these rules to push this um, forward and give us even more credibility. I, if someone else wants to speak, I'll step back. But the other, I guess with the, the larger issue I see is that if you look at medicine, there are subspecialties within medicine, mm -hmm. you know, and they have their own certifications. You know, I, I really see an opportunity for that. Maybe it's there and I'm missing it, but within the field of coaching, you know, to have some, some credentialing certifications specific to the subtopics, because you can coach in just about any field. And, and yet the, um, the content that's needed, you know, in the different areas varies tremendously. So what is your, what are you wrestling with inside of that, Lisa? Um, it's just that, I mean, while I will make ethical decisions about, I will not represent myself as a health coach if I haven't, you know, been updating my, um, you know, updating in that field. Um, it seems like the field of coaching, which we're trying to protect through these ethical trainings, um, is putting itself at risk by not having these sub certifications. So it's more of a structural um, it's a structural thing that I'm noticing that seems to put us at risk as a profession. And it definitely could. And I, I think it is um, looking at um, even when people are creating their website, creating the language around how I describe myself, what am I putting out there that does protect it? and that they know this is what I'm signing up for. So if it is health coaching, that here's the training that upholds this. Um, but yeah, I, I see there, there's an opportunity there, Lisa. You could start moving that forward. <laughs> And I, I think that goes to that competency concerns is uh, if you if you're not skilled in that area or understand that area, uh, should you be coaching in that area? Or if it's I like to ask, um, do you could you wake up every single day and be excited about coaching on this topic every day? And, and if the answer is no, then probably you shouldn't be coaching on that topic, um, which I think does feed that either we, we feed those competencies or we don't. Um, confidentiality breaches. This one is challenging. And Christina, I'm guessing that uh, in your experience, you, uh, you're always managing um, how do I keep the confidentiality when I'm coaching many people in the same company? And, and those are gonna be different rules for different people. I had two executives that I was coaching that were in the same area and they did not know that I was the coach for both of them until one day I had to go to HR and one of them was walking out of HR and one of them was just walking by. And the first one said, hey, Jenny. And then the second one said, how do you know Jenny? <laughs> and it became really uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I made a rule for myself that I just won't coach two directors that are in the same area just because I want them to really to trust me and 
to not feel like, oh, she knows something about me and what does she think of me compared to that person or what, what might she be accidentally sharing or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to do that. Um, also, how do you handle it when you learn something and the person that they're talking about, you know, I had an executive that I was coaching and all of a sudden the person that he started complaining about was a very close friend of mine. And, and I was in this dilemma of, do I share that, that I know this person intimately or not? And those are, those are just dilemmas. Those aren't the, what are, what are going to be your rules? How are you going to handle that? Um, another one I see a lot are boundary issues of um, this piece of, did I make it very clear about what, what I am willing to do and what I am unwilling to do? Even calling. Uh, I had one person that would call me at 10 o'clock at night and insist that I pick up the phone. Um, and so in your agreements, what are your rules around boundaries? Gay, for you, what boundaries have you established with your clients? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my clients, I have through email, through a company, so they can email me anytime, but it's up to me when I choose to respond. So they're very free to message me, but, you know, I don't have to worry about answering the phone in the middle of the night. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, do they have an expectation of like a time period of like in 24 hours, they expect you to respond or? Um... There's no time expectation with wow. these clients, with these clients. Yeah, that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's something for all of you to consider is what, what are my um, expectations that I'm putting out there? Of, uh, what what can they expect of me? What can they not expect of me? Um, time is one, but even the issue of what do, you, what do you do if I meet you outside of a coaching relationship? Um, I've had certain people that I will run into them at a restaurant and they introduce me to everybody. And then I will have other people that I run into them and they pretend like they don't know me. <laughs> Uh, and so even having that conversation up front of what, how do you want me to respond if I see you or run into you? Uh, this questionable billing practices, this seems obvious, but um, there are times that you might forget to bill somebody or it's five months down the road and you're like, oh my gosh, I never submitted a bill uh, and and is it too late at that point to submit something and according to ICF that's that's beyond the you should have done it within the first three months so really thinking about uh, even in my agreements I will bill you within a month I expect payment within x amount of time what are those pieces that you have in place? Um, the unclear informed consent. This is really how are you going to make sure that um, you get very clear on what I'm using the session for? Like if you're recording the session, they need to know. If, if you, I had somebody call me and say, Jenny, I don't know what to do about this. I have a company that wants to, wants to know what other companies I've used and the other companies said it is top secret that you are coaching at our company. So how do I, um, 
demonstrate that I have expertise in this? Well, the best way to do it is go back to that company and say, what can I share with this other company? And have them put language around it. Um, and then this last one, I encourage all of you to put in your agreement that you have a right to cancel the agreement at any time for any reason. Um, because there are just sometimes that you cannot predict uh, that somebody is going to show up in a manner that um, <laughs> surprises you and you don't know how to get out of it. I had uh, somebody that showed up that started um, harassing other uh, coaches and thank God we had in our agreement that if that ha if something happened that we had a right to terminate him at any time but we still had to hire a lawyer we still had to he reported us to ICF and tried to get us in trouble even though he was doing the harassment we had recordings of it he reported us to the state of Minnesota he tried to turn it on us um, and tried to make it about us versus him. Uh, so what do you have in place to protect you if somebody turns crazy on you? When you look at these areas, um, what are your thoughts or comments or things you would add that maybe I didn't put here? Annie, what would you add? Um, I think you've got a really good, well, I guess the one thing that I add, um, is the, um, cause I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. I put in my agreement, the basic differences between coaching and counseling and how we are not going to be doing counseling mm -hmm. and that if something comes up that is that I that might be better served by counseling that I will broach that topic with them mm -hmm. so that they understand that that's something that I'm going to do so it doesn't come as a surprise I not only verbalize that to them it's also in the written contract that they sign I think that's really um, a smart and safe way to approach that. Um, yeah. um, one of the things that I get asked a lot is what do you do if somebody clearly needs therapy and you are a coach? Um, and I'll tell you one thing not to do is to immediately label it as Annie could do that. But the rest of us and maybe, maybe some of you else are a therapist, but the rest of us, that could get us in trouble. And so to simply say that it is out of my scope or my skill set, uh, what, what you want to talk about, and I can help you find somebody else, but I can't coach on that. Um, and let them to decide if this is depression or this is something else. Um, but that's, that's, you you could get in a lot of trouble if you labeled it something. Um, there is a great document, I can't find my camera, um, that ICF has put out that you can just download from their website is referring a client to therapy. Now in here, they, they do um, say something about you need therapy, but I went and Annie, I would love your thoughts on this. I, I think that we shouldn't decide that they need therapy that, but what are your thoughts? I've come across not a lot, but a couple, maybe handful of, of clients where, um, they, like, they really was, go they were going to be better served by, um, doing some therapy about something um 
And so instead of just telling somebody what they need to do, um, we really explore, you know, hey, so Jane, um, you know, would it be okay if I shared with you a little bit of what I'm hearing? So reflecting back to them, um, what I'm hearing using their words and then listening to, uh, so uh, reflecting back to them, because usually when you ask permission to reflect back, most people will say yes. Um, and then I'll reflect back and then ask a question, um, what comes up for you as you hear me reflect that back to you? And most of the time people will say it really sounds like blank or I'm feeling like X, Y, or Z. And then I'll ask what, what feels like the next best thing for you to do with that? Mm -hmm. And they will, um, they'll say, I don't know, what do you think? And I'll say, well, I have some thoughts, but I'm not gonna go there yet. So I keep asking them to see what is coming up for them. Um, and most of the time they have come to the conclusion themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes in the, in the rare instance when they didn't, I said, again, would it be okay if I shared with you, May, I'd like to take my, my coach hat off for just a moment. Um, and because I have some skill sets over in this other spot, would it be okay if I just shared with you a little bit of what I'm hearing and seeing out of making sure that you get the best possible care and, um, and, and the best possible information. Um, so knowing that I was coming from a place of their best interest um, and making it very clear that there was a line of demarcation, um, stopping coaching right now, going to what I call put on my public service announcer hat with their permission. Um, then, and I do say, I do tell them in, in the intro session and in the agreement that if I hear or see something, I will share that with them with their permission. Um, so then I did say that to that person, here's what I'm hearing. The things that you're sharing with me sound like they line up with the, diag the, the, the symptoms of X. And then I'll just li line those out. I said, so what do you think of that? Um, and in that particular case, they said, yeah, I totally agree. Um, so what, what, um, what's something that I should do now? So then we worked through with ask, at, at me asking them more questions. What, what do you want to do? What feels like the right thing for you? How can I support you? Um, and ultimately, they um, put a pause on coaching and they um, checked in with some counseling and then they came back to coaching, um, feeling so much better. And we continued with our coaching. Nice. And that's how I handled that. Nice. And I think, yeah, you had it in the agreement you had, and you have two skill sets um, inside of that. Uh, for the rest of us, I think it is about um, getting really clear on how do I handle that without, I, I can't do everything Annie did, but there's a lot of what Annie did that I could do is the reflecting back, asking the questions, asking them what they wanna do with that, what are they concluding? All of that um, is beneficial. Um, I am running out of time and the rest of this really is about just determining your process for to avoid ethical dilemmas and hopefully you'll never get into a violation but that where the dilemmas are the things that are probably going to be where you sit and it's always what's the best answer out of two bad choices <laughs> um, and in this process of determine what what's bothering you identify what exactly are the issues inside of it, rank them in importance, develop a plan and take action. Don't just sit on it and take action as fast as you can on it. Um, but I really encourage you to find a group of people that you can talk through this with. Because if you don't have people to th think about it, 
then you're in this bubble by yourself, not knowing, am I imagining this or is this real? And what do I do? And this last piece is just examples of dilemmas and using that process. And what I invite everybody to do is write down one thing that you are going to improve or work on to ensure that you don't get into dilemmas. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. This has been so insightful and it caused me to think that I need to rewrite some of my contracts. So really appreciate that. We'd like to have you fill out a feedback survey. I've dropped that into the chat. So we'd really love to have you give your feedback and also for your CEU certifications. And please join us next month, March 12th. We will have Marsha Reynolds and she's going to be talking about coach the person, not the problem. Jenny, any last words before we break? No, other than if you guys have questions or um, want to touch base on anything that there is, it didn't make sense, please reach out to me. Um, my email, I believe, is on here. Uh, it's, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So thank you. I really appreciate you guys taking the time today. We, thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. And have a great weekend, everybody. Yes. Happy Valentine's Day. Yes.